in a Beacon, Beacon Street apartment. And I worked at Dunkin' Donuts right in Kenmore Square. Do you guys know that Dunkin' Donuts? Yeah. It's still there, right? Yeah. Of course it's still there, Dunkin' Donuts. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the Boston staple of Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, I worked there. I worked the morning shift. I'd get there around 6 o'clock in the morning. And uh, it was cold walking there at 6 o'clock in the morning. And as I would leave work every day, uh, there were these two homeless guys that sat right in front of the doorway. They might even still be there. Uh, but they were there almost every day. And they weren't there when I got there, but they were always there when I left. And I don't know if you guys know this. Has anybody worked at Dunkin' Donuts by any chance? There's odds. Yeah, that someone in the crowd would have worked at Dunkin' Donuts. Um, so <laughs> the one in Kenmore, I'm sure, I, I bet all of them do this. You get tips, right? There's a little tip jar. People put tips in. And at the end of your shift, you clock out and you divide the tips. And tips are mostly like dimes and quarters and a lot of pennies. And all of the people that worked there painstakingly <coughs> divided up, even the, even the pennies, down to make sure everyone gets you know, the four pennies that they got for that day. And you put it in like a paper bag, one of those Dunkin' Donuts paper bags, as so you're walking around with like maybe a dollar bill, but mostly change. So I would walk out of work every day with my dollar bill and mostly change little bag, and I would walk past these two homeless guys. And sometimes I would, you know, stop and reach into my giant, I mean, I have a bag of change. They're asking for change. I have literally a bag of change in my purse. Um, and, you know, sometimes I'd give them a couple quarters or whatever. Uh, but sometimes I would just, you know, just at work, I'm stressed, people are crazy in the city, I just want to get back to my apartment, and I would do that thing where you just don't make eye contact, and you just walk, you know, and you hope that they're just going to realize that you're not walking, maybe you'll be invisible if you don't look at them, um, and I, I, I would do that uh, a lot, actually, and one day, I remember my manager, his name was Jesse, uh, he came out, and he, he had a little bit of a temper, but he was angry this day. He came out, and he was like, someone needs to get those homeless guys out of our area. They are not allowed to be there. He was just like really mad. He's looking around for someone to do it. And, of course, I'm like, don't look at me. I don't want to do it. I'm not going out there. Um, I think he saw maybe, like, the fear on my face. I don't know what. And he just looks at me. He goes, you know, they are taking your tips. If people give them change, they're not giving you change, and you should hate them. And then he went and he yelled at them. And I'm assuming they left. I didn't, I didn't go check. Uh, and, you know, obviously that's, that's a really rough way to treat a human being, to go yell at them, get off our stoop, you're not allowed to be here, you're stealing our money. I mean, that's, that's awful, right? I mean, that's like clearly really abrasive. Well, the more I thought about it, you know, how different was I really acting towards them when I would leave and act like they were a parking meter and just walk by them hoping that they wouldn't see me or ask me for anything? I'm not sure it was really all that different. And I know at BU, um, tell me if I'm wrong, but over, over time at BU, if you didn't have it already, you acquire the skill of not making eye contact, especially walking down Calm Ave, because there's so many people, you know, and you've got to get to class. And so sometimes it's even like a, the, the dinosaur hood. That's like the perfect hood for it. Yeah, because you can kind of just put the hood up. You can have your iPod or your phone or your book if you're still studying for the exam, and you can just walk and just not acknowledge anybody. And you're just hoping that no one recognizes you and tries to wave, because then you have to figure out, am I going to wave back? Is it going to be awkward? Whatever. And, and so it's like a skill that like leave be you and you know how to ignore people and <laughs> it's terrible but, like it's kind of true um and I actually remember when I was dating my husband we came down to Frog Pond and he's from Colorado he never lived in the city and I don't think he knew how to how to ignore people he didn't go to BU he didn't acquire this skill and uh, so we're standing in line in the long line to get to the ice rink and there's a guy that comes up and he's asking for I don't know something and you know, Jonathan was like looking at his pockets. He's like, oh, we should give him something. And I was like, no, you ignore him. Don't look him in the eye. He'll go away. Just don't look at him. He'll leave. And uh, Jonathan was horrified. <laughs> we just started dating. And he's like, who are you? It's a city, Monica. Like, don't look him in the eye. Um, and I, yeah, but, but it is. And, it, and I never made the connection that, like, that's a really rude way to treat a person. I never thought about, is that the way Jesus want me, wants me to be treating people? And I don't think it's just homeless guys asking for money that we treat this way. Um, you know, it's, it's people in our class, it's people looking for a seat in the dining hall that we don't really know them and we don't really want to know them. You know, maybe they, they speak differently than we do. They use language that we would never use. Maybe they're dressed a certain way that we would never dress. You know, uh, we saw them walking Friday night uh, back from a party and they did not look okay and we would never be in that position. And, and we use this skill that we acquire to ignore them and hope that they go away. 
And so tonight, as we look at this upside down, countercultural, what does God want us to do? What does it look like to live in the kingdom of God? Um, I want to look at a story or two and find out what Jesus might have to say about that kind of reaction that we just instinctively have. So, I mean, if you have a Bible, you can turn there. I think we're going to throw it up on the PowerPoint. Um, This is from John 12, to give you some context. This is right after Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, and it's about a week before he's going to die. And uh, there it is. Oh, it's beautiful. Okay. So I'll just read it for it. It says, Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. There it is. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. So let's break down what's happening here. Jesus is at dinner with some of his friends. Uh, Martha is the same Martha who likes to be busy. And Mary is the same Mary who has been commended for sitting at Jesus' feet. And in this story, she's doing something else with Jesus' feet. She's dumping perfume on them. And this wasn't just like a little spritzer bottle that you buy at Sephora. This would have been a huge deal. This was part of her dowry. It was part of her inheritance. And she's pouring it on Jesus' feet. And it's this beautiful act, right, of sacrificial love. Um, But not everyone sees it that way. Judas, Judas is scary. He has a problem with what's going on. He says it should have been given to the poor. Uh, And these days, it's like very vogue, very hip to talk about like the poor and justice and all of that. And that's not a new thing. Like that's been going on for as long as there were people suffering. There were other people saying the right thing to do is to help them in their suffering. And and that's what Judas is, is buying into. He's saying we should help the poor. But he's thinking, I want that money for myself. That's a very clear disconnect, right, between his mouth and his heart. Um, And it's easy to look at him and be like, oh, that's terrible. Well, I mean, it's Judas Iscariot. Of course it's going to be terrible. Uh, But I I actually think we tend to be a little bit more like Judas than we like to admit. Um, I know a lot of times we say, yeah, I care about that thing. I want to help that. I want to change the world. and, and we might even, you know, kind of mean it, but really when it comes down to, like, life change and any sort of sacrificial living on our part, there can be a disconnect. And so I, I think we need to not necessarily cut Judas slack. I don't think that's what we're supposed to be doing here, but, but see ourselves in Judas. You know, I actually think we do that a lot. But what's interesting is that Jesus does not call Judas out for being greedy. He could have, right? He could have looked at him and said, you know, quiet you, I know you just want to steal the money. But he doesn't. He goes somewhere totally else with his, with his response. And um, to get a little bit more context for that, we're actually going to look at another version of this story. Most of you probably know that Jesus' life and ministry wasn't just given to us in one account, uh, or two accounts, or three, four accounts. We have four different lenses through which we can see who Jesus was and what he did. And some stories about Jesus are told only in one gospel, some are told in all four, and this one happens to have been told also in Mark and Matthew. So we're going to throw, there we go, we're just going to talk about Mark, but I put Matthew up there because it's very, very similar, and it's cool how similar similar they are to show that like this actually happened, this was a legit thing. Um, But in in Mark's telling of it, it it says, while he was in Bethany reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. And then the next slide. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you. And you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on her body before, on my body beforehand to prepare me for my burial. burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. So this is a slightly different uh, view on the story. 
uh, obviously, it's, it's the same story. There's a lot of similarities, a couple of little differences, right? Uh, in this one, we find out that it's this guy named Simon the leper. So he was probably a man that had leprosy that Jesus had healed. He's hosting this big dinner. They don't name Mary, but they add some other details. And, and Mark especially gives the second part of Jesus' response. And that's what we're going to talk about. Because at first, when you think about it, I mean, it, even the disciples, even some of the other people, it wasn't just Judas saying we should give this to the poor. Everybody, it was kind of consensus in the room, this is a huge waste of money. We should be doing something better with it. And were they right? <laughs> I mean, it comes off incredibly callous for Jesus to say, no, nah, you're always going to have poor people spend this money on me, <laughs> right? And this is a very famous phrase of Jesus, and it's been taken out of context, I think, a lot. I, I don't know if you've ever really struggled with it, but what is Jesus saying when he says, you will always have the poor, but right now, you need to be thinking about me? It almost sounds like a celebrity tantrum. You know, Do you know who I am? I'm Jesus. Like, of course I deserve the perfume. <laughs> and uh, obviously, there's so much more we have about Jesus' life story to tell us that's not what he was doing. And what's interesting is that Jesus is actually referencing the Old Testament here. He does that a lot. And in this passage, he's referencing Deuteronomy 15. And Deuteronomy is a, a book of laws for the people of Israel, right? Israel was this nation, and God was their king, and God gave these laws to Israel to tell them how to live. And some of them um, we don't really pay attention to anymore because it was don't weave two fabrics together, uh, keep kosher, don't cut your beard, you know, all these other things, mold in your house. I should probably pay more attention to that one. Um, but, you know, all of these laws. But this one was about the poor. And Deuteronomy 15 is all about how God cared for the poor and he wanted his people to care for them. And it wasn't just putting some change in a homeless guy's cup. I mean, they had to sacrificially care for the poor. Anybody that needed money, they were supposed to lend to them. No questions asked. You just you, you give them the money they need. And after six years, on the seventh year, even if you haven't gotten it paid back at all, you cancel the debt. It's over. They don't owe you anything. And not only do they not owe you anything, but you now have to give them some of your flock, some of your own resources to put them back on their feet. You know, it's like almost if wouldn't it be great if student loans worked that way? Can you imagine the world, you know? But that's that's what God was creating. He was creating a world where a, a nation, where these people would, it was incredible generosity, and that's what they were called to do, live these lives of giving. And that's what Jesus is talking about when he says you will always have the poor. There it is. There will always be poor in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed toward your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy in your land. Jesus saying, yeah, yeah, that's right. You, you should give to the poor, but not just once, not just twice, not just when it's some lady's perfume. Your whole life... Your whole life should be one of incredible generosity because that's what it means to follow me. That's what it looks like to live in my kingdom. He's so concerned with them. Um, not just once, not just sometimes, but all the time. That's the standard. So, you know, that's nice. Uh, why doesn't, like, Jesus tell Mary that? <laughs> She's pouring out the perfume. He could have been like, stop right there. That's very nice. You can pour half of it on me, but um, maybe give the rest of it to the poor. Deuteronomy 15, have you read it? You know, go do that. Um, but he doesn't. He doesn't. For some reason, he lets her give sacrificially in this act of anointing. Why does he say that it's a beautiful thing? He says that as long as the gospel's preached, people are going to be talking about this lady and what she did. That's a big deal. And so... We have one more story, and this one's actually from Luke. Okay, now some of you that may have grown up in the church, read the Bible, you know, kind of know these stories. Um, you might even have these details in your head of like, I feel like there's something missing from this story, and that's because there's another story of anointing in the Bible, and it's it's kind of similar, but it's kind of different. Fun fact, okay, back in church history there was an attempt to harmonize all of the Gospels. People felt like all of these stories should make sense with each other all the time. And that's where we got the kind of mythical nature of Mary Magdalene. You guys are familiar with like the Da Vinci Code or kind of other things of that nature. They talk about Mary Magdalene being this harlot, promiscuous woman who was maybe in love with Jesus. And like some people have the idea that, well, they got married and had kids or whatever. All that stuff about Mary Magdalene um, came from this attempt to harmonize these stories. Mary Magdalene was a real person, but this, well, you'll see. So we have this story from Luke. I'm going to read that quickly, too, and we'll parse it out. 
So in Luke, it has one of the Pharisees asked Jesus, asked him to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster, fla alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to tell you. And he said, well, say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Okay, and I'm going to turn this on you, a little biblical interpretation. What are some similarities in the stories? I'm serious. Raise your hand. Give me a similarity between the stories we've read. Anybody? Any? Yes, what's the similarity? Perfume. perfume. Yes, there's perfume in all of these stories. Any other similarities? Why would the church historians have wanted to put them all together? Jesus is eating dinner, and I guess the guy's name is Simon. I'm not sure if it's supposed to be the same Simon yeah. the leper or Simon the Pharisee. Exactly. Okay, so he's at dinner, and the guy's name is Simon. And yeah, that would definitely be like a, hmm, maybe it's the same Simon. And an uh, important thing to remember is that at this time, like, everybody was named Simon. <laughs> you know, there's some names that are just, like, wicked popular, and, like, all of a sudden, all of your friends are named Chelsea or Mackenzie or something. Um, that's kind of, like, what it was with Simon. Even Peter's name was Simon, right, before Jesus renamed him to be Peter. Um, so, but yeah, but looking back on it, if you didn't know that, as a lot of the people did, they were going, Simon, Simon, probably the same guy. They tried to put them together. Any other similarities? Any other similarities? Those are the big ones, yeah. They're both washing his feet. Yeah, there's this thing with the feet. There's this thing with her hair, like a sponge. I mean, there's some, like, weird connections. Um, so it makes sense that they would try and put them together. But there's also some pretty big differences. You know, I think any of the differences between the stories of Mary and the first woman and... And this lady? Yeah. Well, Jesus tells an entirely different story in this one. Yeah, Jesus is talking about something totally else. He's got this parable about money lenders and dead and forgiving it and, and all of this stuff. Anything else? Maybe about the woman. What's different about the woman in these two stories? Yeah. Um, one was a friend of Jesus, pretty much, and the other like, oh, random, like someone he didn't know. Yeah, absolutely. One of them we have named in John is, is Mary. Again, this is of Martha and Mary Mary. <laughs> Um, pretty big name in the Bible. And this woman is, is a what? A woman of the city. Okay, we live in the city. If someone called you a woman of the city, I don't know that it would be such a <laughs> horrible thing. But like it, apparently in Bible times, to be a woman of the city meant something. Okay? She wasn't just a woman of the city. She was a sinner. And um, most likely she was uh, promiscuous, we'll say. She probably worked as a prostitute is, is our best guess. And so in order to save up the money to have this such expensive perfume, she was doing a lot of work. And it wasn't the kind of work that the Pharisees were really okay with, right? I mean, this woman is a nobody. She's dirt. She's an outcast. She's the lowest of the low. And, um, and the Pharisee seems to know that, right? He, he, has, he has seen her. He has judged her, he has judged himself, and he has said, man, I am way better <laughs> than her, right? If there's no one in the world I'm better than, I'm definitely better than her. In fact, she's so bad that if this prophet guy even knew who she was, he'd be running in the other direction. She's so terrible. And um, what's interesting, I think part of why Jesus tells the parable he does here is because Jesus knows the woman, for sure. Jesus knows the Pharisee, I mean, he like reads his mind in the story. That's what it says. Jesus knows his thoughts. 
And I don't think that in Jesus' uh, estimation of the situation, the Pharisee and this sinful woman were really all that different. Now, again, it's very easy to look at the Pharisee and be like, oh, that's terrible. How could you judge someone like that? Oh, the worst. Pharisees. Oh, black. Hate Pharisees. They're always bad. Um, you know, kind of the same thing we do with Judas. Every time you see Judas and every time you see a Pharisee, it's going to be bad. Easy Sunday school question and answer. But um, I think we do this, too. <laughs> I think uh, even though we wouldn't necessarily like say it out loud, um, I mean, this guy said it in his head also. We, we look at some people and we go, man, if I'm better than nobody else in the world, I'm better than that person. They've really messed up. They've really done something. I'm at least, hey, at least I'm not that guy, right? Um, but in Jesus' estimation of things, we're not all that different. Tim Keller is a big pastor guy, and, and he tells a story the way he describes it is to uh, imagine, imagine you, know, you all live in Boston, so maybe you've even seen this. Imagine kind of the worst, dirtiest, homeless vagrant that you can think of. You know, I mean, passed out in an alleyway, dirty clothes that you know, maybe don't fit, are, are just soaked with sin and, you know, diseased, addicted, just, you know, that, that. That is what we look like because of our sin to God. That's how bad our sin is. If you take the Bible at what it's worth when it talks about us, it does not say nice things about the human race, right? I mean, we're broken, fallen people. It says all of our good things are really just shadows of God, and all of our virtues are filthy rags. Fil now, the filthy rags, that idea, it's like dung-soaked clothing. That's what we bring to the table. That's what we have to offer. And um, that's how God sees us. And I don't know about you, but it, honestly, I... If I was to leave after large group tonight, walking back to my car, if I saw someone like that on the street, I wouldn't go near them. I would probably maybe stay on the other side of the street for a while before I had to cross over. I, I certainly wouldn't engage them in conversation, right? I mean, it's practical. You don't want to get mugged or whatever. You have all sorts of things going through your mind. But fortunately, wonderfully for us, God is not me because God saw us in that state, that is who we are on our own. And he didn't ignore us. He didn't avoid us. He didn't walk the other way. He joined us in the filth. He, he came among us in our state to bring us to be like him. That's, I mean, that's amazing, right? That's not what's going through the Pharisee's mind. The Pharisee's pretty convinced that he's, he's in, and this woman, whoever she is, she's out. And she is. She is out. She's a sinful person. Uh, and she comes to Jesus' feet. And Jesus knows her. He knows everything about her. He doesn't have to ask. He doesn't need an identification card. He knows who she is and every single thing that she's done. And he allows her to, to bless him, really, by anointing his feet. He allows that to happen. This was a very intimate act at that time. And especially a woman's hair would have been a very intimate thing. For, for her hair to touch his feet. And um, he's okay with it. He defends her. He knows her. And, and guys, he, Jesus knows us. <laughs> Jesus knows you. And Jesus knows everything that you've ever done. He knows all of those sins that you have maybe forgotten. He knows all of the sins that no matter how hard you try, you can't forget. He knows all the sins that other people know about. He knows all those things that you wouldn't dare let other people know about. And maybe some of you are thinking in your mind, man, if the person sitting next to me knew all of those things, really those things, my deepest, darkest, no one knows those things, if they knew that, I don't know that they'd want me to be sitting here. You know? Well, the fact is Jesus knows those things. And he loves you. He loves you. And if those things were somehow to right now become public, if I was to start flashing your sins on the PowerPoint, Jesus, I won't, don't worry, not even Julie's. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, but, you know, even if, even if all of a sudden everyone was to see all of the worst, worst, filthiest things that you've done, Jesus would still love you, and he would embrace you, and he would stand next to you in this room right now, because that's how much he loves you. And that's the kind of love he shows this woman. He doesn't just 
let it happen, and then tell her to kind of go away, you know. Now that we've got our private time, and I've forgiven you, that's great, but kind of if you, if you leave the back door, that would be great. He doesn't. He looks at her while he's talking to the Pharisee, and he says, she's doing the right thing. Look at her. She's the person that you should be trying to emulate because of the way she's treating me. He stands up for her in the midst of this room of people that were just looking at her with scorn, and yet he doesn't see her that way. He lifts her up. That's a beautiful thing. Um, and that is kind of getting back to our other anointing story, right? The one with Mary, the one right before his death. That is why Jesus lets her spend all that money on him. The disciples were concerned. They're saying, gosh, all this perfume, it could be so much money, we could give it to the poor or whatever, you know, a nice short-term idea for like an instant gratification of goodness. Jesus has eternity in his mind. And he's saying what she's doing is not a waste. It is the best, most wise thing someone could do. Because what she was preparing him for was going to change everything. Cosmic existence change, earth shattering, like it even says heaven was ripped open. That's, that's what is about to happen in the story with Jesus. And we, we talk about it, especially those of us that have grown up in the church, those of us that have been Christians a long time. We all know Jesus died for my sins, right? And, uh, you know, he rose again, and we talk about it as if it was this eternal thing that just kind of happened ephemerally, like maybe it happened in heaven uh, before time. I don't, it, sometimes we just get bogged up in the, you know, esoteric nature of it. But, but this happened on earth. It happened in a time and a place where there were human beings like you and me who knew him, who were next to him in a town that existed. I mean, this, I, I, gosh, it, it blows my mind. The first time I really started to think about, this is totally, sorry, it's an aside, but I feel like saying it. The first time I really started to think about the fact that before Jesus was born, the Trinity was one thing. And after Jesus came and lived on earth, the Trinity is now another thing. Like there was a cosmic shift in the very fabric of everything. And it happened on our little planet. It happened in this tiny little like backwoods, whatever, Jerusalem part of Rome. That's mind blowing, right? And this death on a cross, it happened in time, in space with these normal people around him. And Mary, whether or not she like fully recognized it or not, She's pointing to that. She is part of this eternal thing. And that is a huge deal. And that is why she, she chose the better thing. Again, good job, Mary, right? It's two for two. She chose the better part, and, and she was the one who was being more wise. It was not a waste in what she was doing. Because this cosmic, cosmic thing that happened changed everything. We were that homeless person, vagrant, dirty, lying in our own filth. But because Jesus died for us, now there's, there's no barrier anymore. God took those dirty clothes off of us, and he gave us this white, shining robe so we don't have to stand in shame, so we can stand with him. And so there was this wall, right, between us and God, and, and the, the cross broke it down. But that's not the only thing the cross did. There's a wall between us and other people. There's a wall between us and, and the actual homeless people that live out there. There's a wall between us and these other people on campus that we don't associate with for whatever reason. And, and the cross didn't just break this wall down, it, break, it breaks this wall down too. This, it, it's not there anymore because of what Jesus did. That's, that's what the cross was about. And we get to live that. We get to live in light of the fact that that happened. And that is exciting. The gospel breaks down these barriers. I, uh, I, with my church, almost every summer, I, you know, it'd be great if it was every summer, we work with this camp in France. It's a bunch of teenagers, um, you know, high school aged, right? And they come in, it's a short camp, it's only like 10 days. We, we teach them some English, we talk about Jesus. It's a lot of fun, it's great. And I remember a couple years ago, there were these two boys that came, uh, Sasha and Matthias. And I had to tell you that it was France, because if I told you that it was America, you would never think that people were named Sasha and Matthias coming to a, a camp. Um, but they're French, so it's okay. Those are like normal names, I guess. Um, and they were like 14. They were like the lowest end of the spectrum, right? And this was their first year at camp. They're both coming in. They don't know anybody. Terrifying, right? You go to camp for the first time not knowing anybody, being a 14-year-old boy. I can only imagine. Um, but they came in. And over the course of the first couple of days of camp, it only took a couple of days, Sasha 
who kind of had hair like, um, I think his name was Harry from One Direction, but it was, kinda, it was almost like mine, you know? And, um, but he, and he was just like, they, they were both like this tall. But, you know, he, he had this kind of like hair and he kind of had this little swagger to him. And, and somehow in the first couple of days, he was accepted by the older kids. They thought, oh, he's like our little mascot. You know, so for all of the games, it was like, oh, Sasha, over here, you know. And the girls are making friendship bracelets for Sasha. And, you know, somehow Sasha became one of the cool kids, even though he's just 14 and, and he's new. He became one of them. He was in, right? And Matthias, oh, poor darling little Matthias, he uh, was not so blessed with the hair. <laughs> and uh, he was not really athletic. Uh, he liked to play card games and like Bunko. Do you guys know Bunko? Uh, yeah. Anyway, he liked to play just kind of these, I don't know, childish, whatever. I think they're fun. But, but, but in any case, it wasn't cool, right? And so we have Sasha, who's this cool kid accepted by the teenage girls. And we have poor Matthias, who just had the hardest time. And what was heartbreaking is that as part of Sasha's like rise to popularity was him kind of pushing Matthias away and um, little jokes, little comments, teenage boy stuff, you know. Um, but so Matthias was kind of on his own. He was kind of a loner. And so towards the end of camp, we have this night. And it's called Non-Musical Night of Worship. And it's this time of just deep reflection. And we have these uh, stations that we put up all over this building. It kind of looks like this, actually. When I saw you guys putting that up, I was like, oh, cool. <laughs> I'm into that. And, uh, and, and, you know, different song lyrics to meditate on and, and pray this prayer and, and write a letter to God and all these things. And it's this powerful night. We call it the night of much crying because everyone cries. And, uh, and there was a station where you could trace your hand and then in the hand write a prayer request and stick it on the wall. And other people could come along and put their hand on your hand and pray for that request, right? <laughs> and so Matthias wrote, and I don't remember exactly what it was, plus it was in French, but it, it was something along the lines of, um, God, give me friends. Because he had this hard time at this Christian camp. All the kids were kind of making fun of him. And, and his prayer, his deepest longing was, God, give me friends. He stuck it on the wall. And... Um, and, and Sasha saw it. And during this night of reflecting on the gospel and who Christ is and what he did for us, I wish I could tell you I'm the one that made it happen, because man, would I be proud of myself. But I had nothing to do with it. None of the counselors had anything to do with it. None of the campers had anything to do with it. I, I saw them, though, towards the end of the night, Sasha and Matthias sitting on this couch together, talking and crying and um, and Sasha said he was sorry. He repented. He said, I, that was not right of me to do what I was doing. I, I, I don't want to do that anymore, right? And, and for the last couple of days of camp, Matias was all of a sudden accepted. He had been given Sasha's stamp of approval, and now he was part of the group. He was, he was in the inn. And uh, to the point, actually, we have a talent night on the last night, and people do talents. And Matias's talent, this just tells you who he was, was origami. And he, he got up there, and he wanted to show everyone how to fold an origami frog. And if this had happened at the beginning of camp, it just would have been a huge disaster. But because it happened at the end of camp, there were two whole rows of teenage, cute French girls sitting there going, and then what, Matthias? Oh, and then we fold the ear. And then what, Matthias? Oh, and then we fold the nose. And, and they were so into it, you know? And I don't think they were into it because they all of a sudden loved origami frogs. They were into it because something had changed. Something had changed. And that's, it's a small example. It's, it almost seems trivial in the grand scheme of things, but it wasn't trivial to Matthias. That was a big deal. And that's what the gospel does. It breaks down those walls that we create between each other. That's what Jesus did. And I just want to encourage you guys um, to not, this is going to sound weird, but don't be the disciples. Right? Be disciples of Christ, but don't be like the disciples in our story. Don't be like Judas in the story. Well, it's not Judas, and you're not going to be like Judas anyway. But don't be like the disciples in the story, because they're thinking so small. They were thinking, let's sell this oil, let's give it to the poor, it will do a good thing, and that'll be great. That's what God wants us to do. Do little good things here and there, and that, that's enough. That, that's, that's what it means to live in the kingdom. And it turns out, it doesn't matter how many good things you do, it's not going to be enough 
But the fact is, that's not what Jesus was calling them to. That's not what Jesus died for them to be able to experience. It's not a bunch of little good things. So, so hear me, don't stop doing good things. Keep doing them. Uh, if you see the homeless person, absolutely put change in their cup if that's where you, you know, feel led to do. Say hi to people on Com Ave. Hold doors, wave, uh, tell somebody that they can sit with you at the dining hall if there's nowhere else to sit. Do those things. Um, but don't fall into this bad pattern of thinking of that's what it means to be a Christian. It's just to do those good things. Because following Jesus is not a bunch of little good things. It's a life change. And it's big, and it's radical, and it's not easy, but fortunately it's not you who's doing it, right? God and his very spirit, the spirit that broke down these walls, lives in you to break down the walls here. That's what we get to be a part of. That's what it means to live in the kingdom, is we can actively break down the walls that we create. Um, I, I don't know how I'm doing on time. I got one little last story for you. Uh, so I went to BU, and I uh, was part of a theater group, and I won't say their name because I think they're terrible now. But <laughs> I mean, I'm sure they're great if any of you are like somehow a part of them, but I, I, I doubt it. Uh, but I was part of this theater group, and I was in charge of um, some casting in the shows. And anybody, anybody do theater at all? Is anybody going to know what I'm talking? Okay, one. Good. The story's for you. So... <laughs> So it, when you're doing a show, people come in and they audition, and then you cast them for the show. And this group I was a part of had a bunch of different plays that we were casting for. And I always felt that it was like my calling to cast the people that I knew were not going to get cast. Because they came in and they were just not as gifted, let's say, at theatrics as, as the other people coming in. And so I would always cast them in my shows. And it always actually worked out just fine. They were just as funny and just as wonderful. Um, but that was like my little good thing that I felt like I was doing. That's my good thing. I am helping the outsiders. I'm helping the marginalized. I'm putting them in this, you know, silly little show, and somehow that's a good thing. Um, you know, and it was a good thing. That, that was kind of the extent of what I did as far as reaching out to people um, while I was here. Then I went to seminary. Just graduated from Gordon Conwell Seminary woo -woo, uh, up in Hamilton. And uh, at, at the seminary, there's a huge international population, a huge population of Korean students, some of them um, coming over like, from Korea, and they're learning English for the first time. And, uh, and there's this very clear divide between the Korean students and the non-Korean students. And our professors have noticed this. And they would tell us in class like, constantly, like, guys, that's not okay. You should not have this weird clicky thing that I mean, you're in seminary, you're going to be pastors, what are you doing, right? <laughs> and you'd think of all people in the world that would get it, like seminary students would get it, but we didn't get it. And, um, and, and I never got it, actually. And it was after I, I left the seminary, and my husband and I, uh, we both went there together, and we were talking about it, and we were just so convicted that we had been part of building that wall. And it was never a negative thing. It was never, an, you know, no animosity, anything like that. But it was just that lack of desire to reach out. Um, we felt very convicted by that. And so we're up in Lowell now. We're living in an apartment building where it's like, God is so funny. He does this. He gives you these opportunities to see redemption, right? And so this is our opportunity to see redemption. There's some international uh, people. Lowell's a very international place. And we have this neighbor. Her name is Yuki. Her husband's name is Sunny. They're from Beijing, and she's learning English. And she's so sweet. Um, and it's all, I can't even say it to myself. My husband is really good at meeting people. So he somehow met her doing laundry or something and was like, oh, Yuki's our new friend. We're going to do everything with Yuki. Um, we're going to invite her to church because she doesn't know about Jesus. And we're just going to make her part of our life. And, and we have. We've just, every time we have people over, Yuki's one of those people. She's just constantly invited. We're trying to keep an open door policy of just be, be part of our life. And, um, and it's great. She's great. But it's not easy to do that. It's not easy to reach out to the other. It's not easy to be part of breaking that wall down. Uh, and I guess I just say that to tell you that you will have opportunities to do this for the rest of your life. <laughs> but that you will never have an opportunity like you have now at BU. This is a special place. And I didn't realize it till I left and looking back now, this is a special place where there are so many people here, all jammed in this tiny little two-mile campus on Com Ave, where you're forced to, to see each other walking down the street. Um, you're, you're never going to have an experience like that again. 
and uh, you will have you have opportunities to do this for the rest of your life, but it doesn't get any easier. Uh, so I want to encourage you to, gosh, start now. <laughs> start now, because this is a really great place to start. Um, if we have time, we can do the little discussion groups. One question. Okay, we're going to, your community groups, I hear that's a thing. Um, if you could find your community groups, maybe, and we're just going to talk briefly, very briefly. If you can find your, if you don't have a community group, you can form another group. You guys are all set? Beautiful, okay. Man, how convenient that most of you are just sitting where you're supposed to be. That's great that you organized that. Um, all right, I'm going I'm to duck out of the way so you can read it. But that bottom question there, just take a couple of... Yeah, top and bottom. Thank you, Caroline. That's an excellent idea. Combine the top and bottom question. Use your smart BU skills um, that you've been learning in all your classes to combine the top and bottom question and just talk about it a little bit. Um, first and last. Yeah, I'll move my head. Oh, I'll read them out loud. There we go. Um, what are the poor or needy or marginalized or outcast that we see every day at BU? And what is one thing we'll do differently as God enables us this week? Thanks for listening to this message. To keep up with more messages and Bible teaching, you can like and subscribe.